so I'd like I request the Vice Chancellor to hand over a small token of appreciation uh, for our guest today, Shagarika Ghos. And as many of you would have gathered, uh, Ms. Ghos had spoken at the leadership conclave organized by our management faculty earlier in the morning. Uh, so we thought it would be a great idea for her to also come over to our campus and speak with you today. So at the invitation of the Vice Chancellor, uh, we thought a more useful discussion can center around a problem that we are living through, which is the crisis that liberal democracy faces in the era of elected autocrats. So I understand that it's a pretty loaded uh, topic. Uh, some people might have very strong opinions even before you start evaluating the various sides. Uh, and uh, Ms. Ghosh is no stager to controversy, right? Uh, in her long career in print media or broadcast media, uh, she herself has taken up very clear positions and she's also faced considerable criticism. Uh, so, so we thought it would be useful for us to also have an opportunity to interact with her and maybe get some direct question and answers uh, once she's done with her comments. Uh, so without wasting much more time, ma'am, please you could use this podium and then maybe after half an hour of speaking, we can take some questions after that. Right? Uh, VC uh, Fezan Mustafa, um, everyone here, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, what on earth are you guys doing on a Saturday evening listening to a lecture, yeah? <laughs> you should be out there watching a movie, but I'm delighted to see you here. And uh, it's very nice that you came and, uh, and that too on the crisis of liberal democracy and dem democratic authoritarianism. My God, on a Saturday evening, you guys must be really dedicated. But uh, thank you so much for coming and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to actually speak on this theme. Uh, it is something that I think uh, should concern all of us. Uh, I think democratic authoritarianism and the crisis in liberal democracy is something that affects all of us and impacts our lives in many different ways. Uh, so I think it's uh, important that we talk about it and uh, exchange our views on this. So what I thought I'd do, I mean the normal, uh, you know, I'm used to giving TED talks where you're supposed to speak for nine minutes <laughs> and then open it up for question answer. But uh, you've generously given me uh, uh, about 20 to 30 minutes. I think I'll just speak for that amount and then I'd love to uh, answer your questions. Uh, you can talk to me about anything you want, the media, liberal democracy, democratic authoritarian you know, whatever you'd like to ask me, I'm, I'd love to take your questions. So, the crisis in liberal democracy and democratic authoritarianism uh, is, uh, as I said, a subject that should concern all of us. In 1991, when the Berlin Wall collapsed, Francis Fukuyama wrote his famous essay saying this was the end of history. History as we know it has ended, communism is over, liberal democracy rules. There is no other option to the world but liberal democracy. That is the only uh, form of government that is going to be acceptable from now on. Uh, instead, what we are seeing is that movements that challenge democratic norms, movements that are majoritarian, movements that are anti-pluralistic, anti-multicultural, anti-liberal are now being endorsed by the democratic process. So the enemy of liberal democracy, as Yasha Monk of Harvard University puts it, was communism in the 1930s and fascism in the 1940s. But the enemy of liberal democracy today is illiberal democracy, which is rule of the strongman autocrat, rule of the strongman authoritarian figure, not through communism or fascism or uh, a form of government imposed from the top, but through democracy, through the elected process. Through the elected process, we are getting strongmen autocrats who are subverting democracy by using democratic instruments. So democracy has become like a cancer that has turned on the body itself. 
So there are many examples of this, of course. There's Donald Trump, there's Xi Jinping. Of course, he's not a Democrat, but he's now president for life. Uh, Recep Erdogan of Turkey, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Jaroslav uh, Kaczynski in Poland. These are all examples of elected autocrats. The leader who looms so large in a democracy that democracy itself is undermined. The state no longer remains neutral. The state becomes captured by this autocrat. Institutions are captured, the media is silenced, and there is a real question hanging over free and fair elections. So liberal norms like the separation of powers or the insistence on equality uh, are all subservient to uh, this elected strongman or the elected autocrat. What role does social media play in the rise of elected autocrats and illiberal democracy? You know, as you know, Twitter and Facebook have algorithms that now give you the news that you want to see. So Twitter and Facebook, and we were talking about this in the morning, uh, can figure out what kind of politics you have. Are you a liberal? Are you a, a right-winger? Are you a socialist? Are you a racist? Are you a separatist? Are you a, a xenophobe? And they will tailor the news feed that you get according to your views. So the news feed that you get on Facebook, you may think, oh, I'm getting news feed, which, uh, which is everybody's news feed. No. Actually, Facebook is tailoring that news feed to suit what they think you want. So what is happening is that we are being increasingly imprisoned in our silos. We are being in increasingly imprisoned in our ideological camps where we're only talking to each other. We're only getting the news that confirms our biases. In a hyper-polarized society, you only want to see the news that confirms your biases. Anything that doesn't confirm your bias is not real news. No, this is not true. It doesn't confirm my bi ideological bias. Therefore, it's not true. Now, the journalist is not here to cater to anybody's ideological bias. The journalist, after all, at the end of the day, has to tell the truth, has to give you the facts, has to give you verified, credible, factual information. But that information is increasingly at a discount because people are only seeing or reading what they want to see and they want to hear. So, social media, and this was again a question that came up this morning, far from being an instrument of democratization, which it was uh, intended to be, which it still is in many ways, but is also playing a role in imprisoning people in their ideological silos and making us a hyper-polarized society where we talk only to each other in our echo chambers and where social media platforms are giving us the news we want to consume, thereby imprisoning us further and further in our ideological camp. So, the notion of democracy, which is a shared set of norms and values and a shared set of truths that we all share and that we debate on them, is breaking because we now don't have even a shared sense of norms or a shared set of conventions or a shared sense of truth. Uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, the theorist, said that uh, the middle classes are always favoring a liberal democracy, but that's not true. We increasingly see that middle classes are taking up for the strong man, taking up for the elected uh, for, for the uh, for the elected autocrat because he's seen to be delivering prosperity, he's seen to be delivering the good life, and he's seen to be uh, you know pro development, growth, all the things that the middle class wants is something that uh, the middle class, the thinking middle class, the intelligentsia, if you like, are increasingly favoring this unelected strong man. Another uh, feature of uh, illiberal democracy is, of course, the cult of the army, the cult of the soldier. Now, while we uh, appreciate the bravery of the Indian army and the incredible valor of the men in uniform, but when nationalism is defined by militarism, or when nationalism is defined by the soldier, then we are we are Pakistan, where the nation state is defined by the army and by religion. And that is not what India is. India is supposed to be the 
republic where the uh, civic authority is supreme, where, the, where the, the civilian power is supreme. But now we see a certain glorification of the army, a glorification of war. War on TV is the, is the breaking news with orchestral music playing in the background. Heavenly angels are serenading the brave young soldiers who go into war, which is not war. War is grimy and ugly and bloody and, and terribly degrading. But when war is made into a noble act of self, you know, self-sacrifice to the glorious motherland, I think then we're in danger of creating a kind of militaristic cult, uh, which once again undermines liberal democracy. Uh, there was a Pew Research Survey, which was done last year, which showed that support for a, a strongman leader, unchecked, by the judiciary, unchecked by parliament and unchecked by uh, the, the press is the strongest in India. 55% want, want this elected strong man who's unchecked by any, any form of control. The highest number of young people, in, that is 53% in India, want military rule. How many here want military rule? Anybody? <laughs> no, thank God. So the highest percentage of young people in the world, that's 53% in India, want rule by the military. So this is the kind of uh, mood that the world is in. It's the kind of mood that India is in. And it's the kind of uh, mood that we see spreading, being endorsed by the ballot box. So dem democratic authoritarianism then is this elected leader who destroys independent institutions, muzzles the free media, shuts down the opposition, and does so by the instruments of the democratic state. Let me give you an example. Now, in 2014, during the election campaign, uh, Gujarat Chief Minister Narendra Modi, he was, uh, he was then Gujarat Chief Minister, he wasn't Prime Minister, said, I want to be... India's Chokidar. Don't elect a Prime Minister, elect a Chokidar. Now when the Nirav Modi scam blew up in everybody's face, this Chokidar video was recycled and everybody reminded uh, the Prime Minister that, that uh, you know, he had said he would be a Chokidar. To me, the fact that this scam happened revealed that however tough a chokidar is at the top. The fact is that banking institutions and banking watchdogs did not work, so much so that in 20 PSU banks, including the Punjab National Bank where the scam took place, did not have a workman or an officer director. This is the, the, the watchdog of every PSU bank. And this watchdog of every PSU bank had been vacant in almost 20 PSU banks for six months. So the question arises, who is the better chokidar? Is a single man an effective chokidar sitting alone in Lok Kalyan Mark? Can he be the chokidar for the whole nation? Or is a chokidar actually the range of watchdog institutions that are there to defend the Indian people? You know, an urban legend circulates about, uh, about Modi's tenure as Gujarat chief minister. It is said that the businessmen who approach, uh, approach the Gujarat government were directly given the mobile number of the chief minister and told, look, if you have any red, red tape issues, any roadblocks, contact the chief minister. Your way will be smoothened. Everything will be fine. You'll be able to set up your project in time. Wow. That's real decisive government. You, you have a problem, ring the chief minister, I've got a problem, he sorts it out in one go. But the problem with that is, it's a great decisive way of governing. But the problem with that is, it undermines the institutions. It undermines the institutions of government that should deliver. Yes, there is red tape, there is delays, there are these official roadblocks, there are babus who don't work, but the challenge is to reform them, not just to short circuit the system and say that there is just one person calling the shots. Uh, so, you know, the government claims that it has introduced these tough laws in the Benami Property Act, brought in the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code uh, to enable action against swindlers. But the 
fact remains again i come down to it who will implement these laws if there are no institutions if there are no administrators who will implement these laws the government has not instituted a single lokpal in the last 4 years as many as four posts in the information commission are lying vacant the cbi which has been described as a caged parrot has not been set free in fact uh, the appointment of a, the special director of the cbi a certain gujarat ips officer was appointed in very controversial circumstances showing that the government is really not interested in setting the cbi free it still is a caged parrot now how can you pursue the fight against graft if your federal policeman is under the stick of the government election funding is arguably the most uh, notorious way of corruption now what has this government done for election funding the government has come up with the issue of electoral bonds you can purchase electoral bonds and donate to political parties but the problem with this electoral bonds and this is of course now been challenged in court is that the do- the purchaser of the electoral bonds is anonymous nobody knows who is go- who is purchasing these bonds if you purchase a bond for example you there in the check shirt if you purchase an electoral bond you have to stay anonymous nobody will know that you have donated to party x or party y but the government will know the information is there with the government so the government knows hey this person there in the check shirt has donated to this party set the cbi on him you know what i mean so the fact is it's not a fair choice why should the person remain anonymous why should it be that i'm so scared that if i donate to a particular party why should i have to be anonymous why can't it be known that i'm donating to this particular party why is that why do i have become the enemy of the state and if the public doesn't know if i'm unprotected by public knowledge then why should the government know because if the government knows and the public doesn't know then it is open to misuse and uh, certainly does not advance the cause of transparency demonetization similarly an act of democratic authoritarianism no discussion with stakeholders no discussion with the opposition parties overnight announcement 100 uh, 500 rupee notes 1000 rupee notes out but what's happened uh, 15.28 trillion rupees are back and 99% of the money is back in the uh, system so you see it's not about i mean what is black money black money is not an act of original sin black money is simply money on which tax has not been paid so the idea is to get rational uh intelligent institutions to track down those who are evading tax and to get them to pay their taxes now this is not a quasi religious purification yagna that is necessary to morally purify a, a, a degraded evil immoral system where you know um asuras are roaming around and we need gods to come and rescue i mean this is not mythology you know it's not a it's not a, a, a sort of a, a rel- quasi religious puja it's it's a, it has to be a rational act by institutions to get people to pay taxes now if you're going to make that a a, a kind of religious yagna then you're criminalizing business and criminalizing uh, wealth creation which to my mind uh, defeats the purpose public sector banks are now seen as uh, increasingly you know uh, pa- you know they are seen as uh, symbols of this uh, uh, babu politics n- uh, nexus now this, the punjab national bank was even given awards by the central vigilance commission uh, while this scam was going on so that shows you how uh, how uh, how there simply isn't no, any reg- regulatory monitoring how can there be regulatory monitoring when the only regulator is the sole chokidar sitting uh, in his home so the again these are the problems of being the single chokidar now a commitment against corruption 
or a commitment against graft. And this government has to be praised. I mean, it's trying its best to, to, to fight corruption. Yes, it's seeing it as a purification religious yagna, but it is trying to fight corruption. It is trying to bring money to the system. Yes, I mean, let's give credit where it's due. It's trying to do that. But any fight against corruption must see the whistleblower or the RTI activist as an ally. Instead, what has happened? Since 2005, 67 RTI activists have actually been killed. The Right to Information Act is being systematically weakened. Questions have been raised about the appointment of the CVC and the government has refused to answer questions on uh, RTIs, which are asking for the names of the loan defaulters. Uh, you know, in 2016, when eight CME activists uh, were uh, shot in an encounter killing in Bhopal. I, I, I don't know if you remember, in 2016, eight Simi activists were gunned down and said these, these are Simi activists and they've been gunned down. The Minister of State for Kiran Rijuju told the, uh, told the press that why are you keeping on asking questions? Uh, this asking questions is not a good culture. We should not have this culture of asking questions. Uh, this is not a good culture and uh, we should not ask questions. Democracy is about asking questions, actually. You know, we reminded the Prime Minister, uh, or the, Chief, the Minister that. Perhaps if more questions had been asked, the Nirav the Nira Modi scam would not have taken place. Perhaps if more questions had been asked when the unilateral demonetization decision took place, uh, questions would have been asked about the accountability of banks. If demonetization was supposed to be a war against corruption, the fact is, after demonetization in 2017, Mr. Nirav Modi was still obtaining uh, letters of uh, undertaking from uh, the Punjab National Bank. So, so for, for him, it was VIPs, it was business as usual for the, for the VIPs. Demonetization or no demonetization. The finance minister recently said that, oh, politicians are accountable, regulators are not. As if it's the regulators who are responsible. But it's the job of the government to create independent, autonomous regulators. Unless you create independent, autonomous regulators, which are insulated from uh, the VIPs, this is continually going to happen. So these institutions, CBC, CBI, Judiciary, RTI, CIC, Bank Watchdogs, these are the real chokidars of India. These are the real chokidars of the Indian people. And unless they are made vigorous, independent, and staffed by persons of courageous integrity, the interests of democracy will not be served. So you can't have democratic authoritarianism if you're going to pursue a war on graft. If you want to pursue the war on graft, you have to strengthen institutions. And you, if you want to strengthen institutions, you have to strengthen liberal democracy. You have to strengthen uh, the institutions of liberal democracy. So, what does democracy mean? What does liberal democracy mean? It essentially means that you have to play by certain rules. Government and opposition abide by certain conventions and by certain norms. You know, you don't win elections by throwing all norms to the wind. You don't win elections by simply by throwing democratic conventions into the wind. I want to just read out a quote from uh, Michael Ignatiev, who is a political theorist and former leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. And he writes, for liberal democracies to work, politicians need to respect the difference between an enemy and an adversary. The difference between an enemy and an adversary is that an adversary is someone you want to defeat through argument. An enemy is someone you have to destroy. Democracy is not about destroying your enemies. Why should the BJP want a Congress Mukt Bharat? Yeah, I mean, Congress in itself is making itself Mukt, but uh, that's a different issue altogether. But uh, the fact is, it's not about Congress Mukt Bharat. You have to win the argument, mount the counter narrative, mount the argument. Don't, you know, don't wipe out the opposition. That is not democracy. It's not liberal democracy to wipe out any opposition as if this is a mortal enemy against you whom you are fighting a holy war. 
you know this is again this this narrative of pious holy war of the war of the devas versus the asuras and this is a kind of amar chitra kathaization of democracy which uh is a kind of a strange aberration because it's really not about uh, about destroying the enemy but it's about in fact making sure that there is an enemy and uh, you know defeating the enemy in 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 battle so there have to be the limits to pursuing the partisan interest there have to be there has to be the knowledge that winning an election or passing an urgent law is less important all this is less important than preserving the system preserving the norms and conventions of the system preserving the institutions preserving liberal democracy first you have to preserve the system you see you can't destroy the system altogether if you destroy the system altogether then then you might as well have military rule or rule by one man so you have to accept that the system needs to be preserved and within that you uh advance your aims who was the person who started this rot i just written a book on indira gandhi and i have to say that indira gandhi really was no democrat she was in her essence deeply authoritarian she pretended to be a democrat she perhaps believed she was a democrat but she was highly authoritarian and highly autocratic and the tragedy of the emergency is that it hollowed out institutions hollowed out the executive hollowed out the judiciary hollowed out the congress party hollowed out the parliament and it started this process of attrition of institutions which nehru had so painstakingly nurtured which nehru had so painstakingly built up that she hollowed these out in the quest for absolute power now she was independent india's first personality cult you know we love personality cults i think it's a mark of the fact that we feel powerless as people so that we worship power we actually adore power you know the bahubali which is that big film that we're watching these days bahu bahubali mahabali bahubali you know so we love the bahubali the dabang the the e- extremely powerful force and i think the reason for that is because we feel powerless and indira gandhi was in a way india's first bahubali she hollowed out institutions destroyed the congress party and made it entirely about herself made it entirely about her own cult of personality so that when she died her place could only be taken by her son when her other son was alive when he died it, her, his place could only be taken by another son so it was really she who i think is the parent and original of this elected autocrat syndrome and today so many politicians play by the indira gandhi playbook why blame mr narendra modi alone there is uh, ms mamta banerji mr nitish kumar ms navin patnaik uh, politicians across the board play by the indira gandhi playbook any politician today who collides with the system collides with institutions collides with the media collides with the uh, bureaucracy reaches over the heads of the citizens and reaches over the heads of the party and reaches directly to the citizens in a kind of populist embrace is playing by the indira gandhi playbook uh and i think that is what that is the damage that she did and i think it's the damage that continues on till this day Let's take a look at what's happening then to institutions in India. Uh we've noticed that already the youth are seduced by the strong man, the youth are seduced by personality cults, the youth are seduced by power and we worship power. The judiciary. What is happening to the judiciary? I mean you I'm sure you have all followed the revolt of the judges. Uh, and what's happening and of course you know and the very impassioned cry of uh, justice ap shah recently at the bj vergis memorial lecture where he said cry cry out loud because things have gotten so bad that you just have to cry out so you know what's happening to the judiciary and we can talk about this and i don't want to uh, get more into it the press i mean i come from the press the free press in india is almost dead freedom of the press is almost dead we have 
journalists now who have to be nationalists, who have to be patriots, who every night on the news are saying the nation wants to know. But what does the nation want to know? The nation only wants to know what the opposition is doing. The nation doesn't want to know what the government is doing, will ask no questions of the government, will ask no questions of the Prime Minister. The only thing that the national media, uh, nationalist media will do is ask questions of the opposition. Arun Shuri had a great name for them, he calls them the North Korean channels. So these North Korean channels have, have, uh, are now the proud bearers of, uh, of uh, journalism. And, uh, you know, it is, it is terrible what is happening. There is, there is literally hate and communal poison coming out of news channels. My counsel to all of you is switch off the news channels, turn to digital, turn to the printed word. It's a little more sane. It's a little more rational. At least you won't go crazy. So the role of the media as a dissenting voice to authoritarianism, the role of the media as the questioner, you know, Karan Thapa wrote a very interesting article. He said, instead of being the watchdog of the establishment, journalists are now the guard dogs of the establishment. So we are the fierce guardians of the people in power. So this is the meat, you know, it's almost freedom of the press, RIP. Uh, what about parliament? You know, parliament has been reduced. We are seeing the Vidhan Sabhaization of parliament. The government is pushing through uh, legislation, uh, all legislation uh, through, with, with, uh, through money bills. There's no discussion. Today, if you if you're a great speaker in parliament, you may not get elected. Those days are gone when Minu Masani and Apilu Modi and George Fernandez gave the, you know, Garma Garam Bhashan in the Lok Sabha and stirred up the benches and because of their performance in parliament, they went outside and they also got elected. Those days are gone. Now you will get elected because of, uh, you know, caste and religion and, you know, various other factors. It doesn't matter how you perform in parliament. So, parliament, parliament is almost becoming an irrelevancy. That's a really worrying thing. That how you perform in parliament or how you debate in parliament really doesn't matter because your electability is not coming from there. It doesn't matter how you, how you perform in parliament. Who cares if you're giving some great... Oh, Mr. Derek O'Brien is giving brilliant speech after brilliant speech. But Mr. Derek O'Brien will probably not get elected. So, you know, we have to look at what is happening to parliament and how, you know, the, the, the big politicians really do come to parliament. They don't come to parliament. It's, it's parliament has become almost like a kind of a uh, sort of talking shop where you just sort of barely, your, there's, there's adjournment after adjournment and uh, it's mostly irrelevant. So, the Vidhan Sabhaization of parliament I think is a, is a very, very worrying thing and something that we should all think about and worry about because uh, it again shows that um, that uh, we are becoming this democratically authoritarian uh, nation. You know, I just want to read out a quote from Ambedkar, which I think uh, is, uh, is very relevant here, where he says about idolatry and hero worship, that India is still par excellence, the land of idolatry. There is idolatry in religion, there is idolatry in politics, Hero and hero worship is a hard, if unfortunate, fact of Indian political life. But bhakti, or the path of devotion in politics, leads to degradation. So when you have bhakti in politics, maybe I should tell this to the BJP IT cell. So when you have bhakti in politics, uh, you basically, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're bolstering this cult of hero worship where you are uh, pushing democracy into illiberalism and into democratic authoritarianism. So personality based politics, politics based on towering personality cults is something again the media encourages. The media is uh, highly involved in creating these personality cults and personality based politics. And this is the personality based politics that is I believe rampaging through the world at this moment and uh, creating the democratic uh, authoritarian leaders, creating a liberal democracy at a moment when institutions are in severe jeopardy. So unless we, the citizens of India, do something 
uh, we are going to see a severe degradation of democracy. What's the way out? What's the way out of all this? I'll leave you with some thoughts. Uh, these are also thoughts given by Yasha Monk of Harvard University, who I consider uh, really one of my formative, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I read a lot of him. I think he's a wonderful writer. And he's just come up with his new book, The People vs. Democracy, which I uh, urge you all to read. Uh, so what's the way out? Like, the way out is, yes, money power in politics has to end. Institutions have to regain their autonomy. Citizens have to realize that we need to create a civic and liberal and inclusive patriotism. That our patriotism is liberal. You know, Gandhi fought the British Raj. He never fought the British. He never hated the British people. It, he always said that the British are welcome to stay on in India, but as equals, not as masters. So it was never a campaign of hatred against other people. It was a campaign against an unjust rule and again, it's an unjust system. So uh, it is in fact, in many ways, uh, we, you know, the, 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 the campaign has to be to create this liberal patriotism. The, 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 the patriotism that India is founded on is liberal, is inclusive, is not based on hatred. We're now seeing a nationalism which is based on hatred and creating enemies. That is not the foundation of the Indian nation. But I think above all, above all this, I think liberal democracy, and Monk makes this point as well, has to at some point rediscover its moral halo. It has to rediscover its moralism. Mistakes have been made under the guise of liberal democracy. Liberal democracy has become corrupted. Liberal democracy has been a camouflage for all forms of extremism. Liberal democracy has been a camouflage for all forms of corruption. Uh, the Congress took the high moral ground on being liberal and, and, and plural and, you know, proceeded to loot India. Um, Others have taken the camouflage of secularism and proceeded to loot India and become involved in fodder scam cases and all of that. So liberalism and secularism and pluralism have been given a bad name. But I think it's time that perhaps we try to restore the morality of liberal democracy, try to restore the, the moral power of liberal democracy and believed in its moral power. Uh, and I think that's a tall order, but unless that happens, I believe that liberal democracy is doomed and we are in for a long spell of uh, democratic authoritarianism. Thank you. I'll take questions from the back. Okay. Sure thing. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, uh, you can raise your hand. Yeah. We have three hands so far. Yeah, got it. And one here. Yeah. Ma'am, I'm Anik and I have two questions. Yeah. Firstly, you say that the manifestation of autocracy arising out of a democracy is through the free media being muzzled and the systematic dem oppression of the opposition through democratic means. Could you please elaborate on that? I mean, particularly in case of Bengal, you see that the media has been muzzled and you had a particular experience with that. <laughs> and uh, the opposition has been, there is literally no opposition left in Bengal today. So could you particularly elaborate on how it is done through democratic means? And this... Okay. Uh, well, you know, it's the elected Democrats who are doing this. Uh, you know, uh, I think you're referring to Mamda Banerjee's uh, 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 attack on the Facebook, the doctor with the Facebook post. And I think the other article, the a cartoon, I think that was circulated by, uh, by uh, one of the, uh, you know, by, by a scientist. Absolutely. I mean, these are uh, highly illiberal autocratic acts committed by a so-called Democrat. So uh, here was someone who came to power on the basis of a huge mandate, on the basis of the ballot box, which is why I'm saying, you know, 
a lot of leaders today are playing by the indira gandhi playbook this is these are the rules that indira gandhi in a way patented that you come to power through a huge mandate so you've come to power through the ballot box you haven't come to power through uh, through armed rule or through fascist takeover you you've been elected to power but you know we have become what ashish nandi calls a sephocracy not a democracy we only have elections that's the only thing we have we don't have the institutions or the um, mindset or the processes that democracy requires you know which nehru labored to to put in place in the 1950s because if you read nehru's letters to the chief minister chief ministers which i've read in great detail he literally labored that we should all free up, politicians should free themselves from psychophancy the politicians elected politicians cannot want psychophants elected politicians cannot want loyalists that's not what an elected politician this that that's not democracy but then uh, you know those norms and that mentality and that kind of thinking and those institutions are not there so in a way it's like we're a sephocracy and not a democracy and the question is we have modi in delhi today and banerjee at kolkata do you <laughs> this clash of autocrats or are we becoming something like the polish citizens in 1939 struck between <laughs> hitler and stalin uh well you know i think I, I, both are autocratic leaders uh there are lots of autocratic leaders throughout uh, throughout india i mean you know why is it that polit- that the interview is dead today as a journalist the adversarial questioning interview is dead who gives interviews why should we, will mehbooba mufti tell us why she sacked haseeb drabu we'll never know will mr modi have an open press conference where journalists openly ask questions no will sonia gandhi have an interview where she answers questions about bofors no will mamta banerji have a question where she asks where she answers questions on why she's cracking down on facebook posts and why she's cracking down on uh, various things no rahul gandhi will ask will take questions but in singapore is some singapore question or will ask a question he'll take that question he won't take any questions in in delhi so uh, you know uh, mr modi will only take questions with those gentle lobs you know which he will hit for a six like he'll hit them out of the boundary he's not going to take a bouncer he's not going to take an open question so the interview is dead there is no interview left anymore now there's social media you can all mr mr ms sushma swaraj has been uh, foreign minister for four years she's not given a single interview we don't know what the foreign minister thinks she's only tweeting so you know with with tweets and on social media we we really don't need the the journalist anymore but the journalist stands for something you see the journalist stands for asking questions on behalf of the citizen we need to know now why exactly did ms mehbooba mufti sack haseeb drabu her finance minister why we can speculate there are rumors there are lots of things being asked said but we don't know from her and we're not allowed to ask so uh, you're right i mean it's a clash of autocrats and uh, but uh, you know as i said uh, i think the drama of indian politics unfolds every day so now we're seeing a perhaps a no trust motion let's see what happens okay two students at the back sarthak hardik right and, yeah. please wait for the mic the, the yeah. hello hello is that audible yeah cool so ma'am hi i am saksham uh, hi. so you talk about hello yeah so ma'am you talked about uh, institutions like cbi and cbc being staffed with uh, more pe- people with more integrity and 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 sorts but uh, i have a uh, so how do we exactly do that so let's say because most of these secretaries from for most of these commissions are effect uh, are elect are uh, nominated by do, uh, democratically elected uh, individuals in the power so because this happens so these people if in case let's say an, a democratically elected person then appoints a integral uh, appoints a person with a lot of integrity in that case is that not again uh, him justifying what is 
integrity for him and then appointing that person for that specific post as in it's a it's a vicious circle that we are we are looping into right so how exactly do we solve this problem when we say that uh, people oh. well i think uh, you know i think by persons of integrity i mean persons who are known to be upright who are known to be honest who are known to uh, be persons of high moral character i mean those are uh, persons who exist they have existed in the past uh, and they should be ideally without party affiliation i mean if they are party faithful uh, you know if you uh, take your party henchman and say that well he is the most in great integrity person then clearly you know he's not because he's a party faithful so i think there are neutral people out there there are moral people out there there are people of integrity out there there have been in the past mr sheshan was a great uh, election commissioner there have been heads of uh, mr karthikeyan was a was a great chief of the cbi uh, you've had uh, um you know you had very uh, mr jain dikshit was a great foreign secretary um mr you know there have been uh, very upstanding civil servants who have been cabinet secretaries so i think there are people of integrity in the system but you see if you if the system is fearfully trembling of the soul chokidar then everybody is so scared that nobody is going to be able to uh, to be autonomous and nobody is going to be able to voice an independent opinion so you can't you know you can't be uh, the, the 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 prime minister of india or the chief executive of india is simply that he's the chief executive that's all he is there's a chief justice there's a leader of the opposition there's a chief there's a head of the ruling party there's a federal police now the CBI is the equivalent of the FBI the federal bureau of investigation is uh, you know is not under the direct thumb of the president of uh, the united states you know we, we know the story of j edgar hoover who of course went off on his own tangent but you can only have a fully functioning federal police if that police is autonomous if the federal policeman or the policeman of the center is under the thumb of the elected representative then how is he a federal police he is simply an agent of the political party so our system is about checks and balances it's about the separation of powers uh, that has to be implemented that has to be upheld by the elected representative he has to understand he's an elected representative of the political executive no more no less you know that's what he is you are not the king of india you are not the monarch you are just the head of the government thank you thank you for the talk ma'am uh, so political systems are instruments to reach certain objects they are not an end in itself so i, I think a part was missing in the talk i would want to uh, i would want to request you to tell us the objects that the, uh, the liberal democracy is seeking to reach the problems that this country is mired in which the liberal democracy would solve and if the normative liberal democracy that we are talking about is fit political system to solve those problems or the or to reach those objects i think so i think liberal democracy is uh the way we have chosen it is the way the constitution has chosen liberal democracy is at uh, places at its center as i said the separation of powers equality of the individual liberty for the individual uh fratern you know liberty equality fraternity is what it what it posits uh liberty i think we need the freedom of thought we need freedom of expression we need the freedom to eat what we want and we need the freedom to wear what we want we need the freedom to love whom we want we need the freedom to marry who we want we need the freedom to uh live the way we want read what we want uh write what we want see the movies we want so i think in that in terms of securing individual freedom there is no uh there is no substitute for liberal democracy social justice 
you know we need to create social justice so that uh, the fruits of development are distributed equally now you could say that a fascist dictator will uh, distribute the free fruits of uh, development uh, better because he will simply be able to channel channel from the rich into the poor and play robin hood i don't agree i believe as amartya sen said that uh, democracy and equality is at the center of a just economic system and that if you do want the equitable distribution of resources if you do want want the uh, the equitable distribution of opportunities you do need to empower people politically you in, uh, need to empower people through political representation there again i think liberal democracy scores uh, so individual rights economic uh, economic equality economic uh, you know e- e- economic uh, redistribution access to justice access to but um minority welfare there again i think liberal democracy scores because uh, there again i think minority the, the representation of minorities and the uh, rule by elected representatives who are accountable to the people uh, is the best way in my opinion to secure uh, well being of minorities the garika when framing up so we were conscious of this issue that of course no one was thinking that we will revert to monarchy so no one unlike 1857 we did not proclaim any descendant mughal emperor so democracy was a foregone conclusion now within democracy <coughs> within democracy in the presidential form of government the chances of president becoming totalitarian are much more and therefore just because we were used to cabinet system of the british uh, constitution we adopted that and the idea was that since <coughs> prime minister will be the first amongst equals we will not have that kind of problem in a parliamentary democracy but over the years when you have leaders like indira gandhi or narendra modi or other uh, leaders who will come up with massive mandate like mamta banerji or in chief ministers in different states they are never first amongst equals yeah therefore in the cabinet meeting since all the ministers are his nominees and if they descend immediately he will throw them out or she will throw them out so what do we do we cannot go back to the presidential model of government because we rejected it consciously in a parliamentary form of government as i have written about even this whole yes. uh, disqualification business that the whole law of disqualification the right of, to recall of, of office, is no, no. no office of profit office of profit it is faulty yeah. because what is our demand our demand is because no government is going to pick up mp or mla of opposition for these positions which they right. create like secretaries so we want members of the ruling party to be independent of government so yes this is not possible it is their government therefore my suggestion is that this disqualification should go mm-hmm. because it is not practicable now having said that similarly in a cabinet system where the prime minister will call shots prime minister will have that kind of power because all mps in bjp know that they are there because of the prime minister they owe their position to prime minister and therefore he will have his clout and his power so do you think in this scenario rather than having one party majority the only thing possible which will ensure that the prime minister will not become totalitarian is to have a coalition government yes yes absolutely i think coalition governments are excellent governments because you know we may see think of them as rickety coalitions we may think of them as uh, stumbling blocks we may think of them as but if you look at the history of coalition governments the upa1 and upa2 were coalition governments vajpayee 1999 to 2004 was a coalition government and the the achievements of the vajpayee government 
were far greater in a way than the achievements of the present government with its huge mandate. In fact, if you see the governments with the hugest mandates are the first to lose the mandate. Indira Gandhi came to power with a huge mandate in 71. By 75, she, was, she had declared the emergency. She had lost the mandate. Rajiv Gandhi came with a huge uh, mandate in uh, 1984. By 1986, he had Beauforts and he was out. So these huge mandates, Mr. Modi has come with a huge mandate. Who knows what will happen to Mr. Modi now in 2019. It's looking open, folks. It's looking open. So, I mean, you know, but these huge mandates do not necessarily mean that you'll have a high achieving government. Whereas the UPA won with its intense coalition pressures, with the intense coalition pressure of the left, was actually able to enunciate legislation, it was actually able to come up with policy initiatives, it was actually able to come up with uh, a, a number of, uh, a number of uh, issues, deal with a number of issues, uh, you know, whether it was RTI or Aadhaar or Manrega or the Whistleblowers Act, I mean, all of the things that the present government is today upholding were all creations of UPA won. So, uh, in that sense, I think a coalition government uh, necessarily is not as underachieving or as much of a rickety coalition as we think it is. Sometimes they are high achieving governments, they are modest and unassuming governments and because they are kept in check by coalition partners, there is no super uh, overwhelming executive. You know, for example, if you look at the uh, position of Chandra Babu Naidu from 1999 to 2004. He was a dominant coalition partner in the Vajpayee coalition. He was literally almost calling the shots. So if he threatened to withdraw support at that time, it would have brought down the Vajpayee government. Today, Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu withdraws support. The BJP doesn't care. They don't give a toss because it really doesn't matter to them. They're a majority government. They hold power in the center and they don't have to appease allies. So they don't have to give Andhra Pradesh what it wants. So I believe that a coalition, you're absolutely right. I think a coalition government tends to be a more unassuming, often a higher achieving government than a government that comes in with a huge mandate and an overwhelming personality, you know, who then dwarfs every other institution. But you know, Nehru himself was an overwhelming personality. Nehru himself was a colossus. But Nehru was a believer in institutions and a believer in democratic processes. It's very difficult to find someone today who has won with an overwhelming mandate who still retains a belief in democratic institutions and processes simply because they will not accept any check on their power. So um, I think that's a, that's a very important point. Okay, uh, we had one hand there. Hello, ma'am. Pallavi and Dilav, right. Hello, ma'am. Um, I'm Sankalp. Thank uh, you for the talk. Yeah. Hello. Hello, ma'am. No, I'm please Sankalp. Please. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, so, you're a journalist, right? So, how I do you... I think so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Until I last remembered, yes. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> so, how do you seek to counter anti-intellectualism, basically? That's uh, being endorsed by elected members of the uh, government. And because of the cult following, it's been, you know, uh, sort of reflected among the electorate themselves. So, how do you seek to win back their trust? Because they will denounce whatever you've said just by the virtue of you being an intellectual. Or uh, How do I win back the trust yeah. of the people? Thank God, I'm not in politics. I don't have to win their trust. <laughs> because... I mean, whatever you... you uh, whatever say. I say. Look, I think, you know, I think there are... I mean, I think what's happening to journalism is terrible, right? It's really become horrible. I mean, uh, I, I think you saw the Sridevi death coverage. Uh, you know, that was a time when I really began to question, am I a journalist? Like you, I asked, that, I asked myself that question. Am I a journalist? But, uh, you know, what, what, am I, what, what is this industry I'm a part of? You know, Rithik Roshan and Kangana Ranaut. For the life of me, I cannot figure out what is the public interest in that story. I mean, this seems to me a personal exchange of emails. And I was reading those and thinking, what is the interest here? It's not even controversial. There's nothing in it. It's just two people saying hi, hello on the on on the email, and still it's prime time news day after day after day. And I'm thinking, you know, what am I missing here? There has to be something, but there really isn't. So I think um, 
the way in which uh, news headlines is uh, are being uh, are being created it's all about the crisis in the media you know the crisis in the media is happening because the business model of the media is broken it's it's finished uh media is driven now by advertising and advertising driven media is sensationalist media commercial media trp hungry media i don't know if you saw the uh, cover uh, the story by caravan magazine which showed that mr nation wants to know who comes at 9 o'clock he shall remain nameless then mr nation wants to know his ratings for the 9 o'clock bulletin for 6 months his ratings were coming from one household in gujarat in chennai that one household in chennai was keeping the, his program on 24 by 7 and that's how his ratings were rising so it's really all a game and 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 i think that you know unless the viewing public pays for their news we're never going to get quality credible journalism you know if you pay peanuts you will get monkeys you pay peanuts for your channel you will get monkeys and at the moment that is what it, media is reduced to so yes there is anti intellectualism across the board in journalism and it's happening precisely because of the three evils of journalism which i talk about commercialization sensationalization politicization you know these are the three evils of the media and i think that it's happening because of the broken business model and i need to go back to a subscriber driven model of news where viewers pay for quality credible fact based news you know when i started in journalism you began as a reporter you brought in your story to the news desk that went to the news desk it went to the news editor it went to the chief news editor it went to the deputy news editor then finally it went to the editor in chief so it went through layers of fact checking layers of verification layers of uh, checking for bias and then it was published that is the uh, that is the finished product that is published which is checked verified credible without bias that is the job of the professional journalist now is facebook a publisher is twitter a publisher they're not publishers so what they're publishing is not subject to any of the checks any of the fact checking that we as journalists are trained to do because when we put out something as publisher when the publisher puts out something it is it goes through these multiple layers of checking then it's published as the truth so uh those checks are now missing uh everything is now you know clickbait and you know uh, titillation and headlines and headline hungry and somebody is going here so you know you know the breaking tweet a breaking tweet can be a government falling or a politician abusing somebody else or a film star abusing another film star all these things are all on the level of 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 breaking news so breaking news has broken down you know breaking news is broken and and i think it's happening because of this race for advertising the race for money it's a bottomless pit um and i think uh, you know i think television news to me is dead people should switch off television news actually you know work hard at your news go to digital go to newspapers you know i think the days of the single source for news that this is my only I will only read this newspaper I will only watch this TV channel is gone we now need to work hard at our news and look at many sources where the news is coming from to see whether what we're seeing is true or not so uh in fact yes there is uh rampaging anti intellectualism but i think some slow spaces in journalism remain you know there is the journalism of the fast today everything is journalism of the fast media 360 you're seeing it as it happens accident happens you're seeing it something else is happening you're seeing it it's a t20 match when i used when we used to cover elections in the mid 1990s we used to be sitting in the party offices for 3 days elections used to come out after 3 days a results used to come out after 3 days because the the counting would take that long now it's a t20 match for 3 hours you're seeing rajdeep giving you the results you know thick and fast and he's telling it to you and you're like you can't breathe you can't move you can't eat because you're like you know watching the elections so it's all happening really really fast and, but i remain a fan of the journalism of the slow 
and I believe that we have to hang on to the slow spaces. We have to hang on to those places where there is analysis, where there is objectivity, where there is uh, reflection, where there is introspection. There are some spaces like that. I think you're seeing a lot of meaningful journalism shift online. I think you're seeing a lot of investigative journalism, a lot of field-based reports, a lot of reporter-driven um, journalism shift online. So I think there are spaces. And I think there is on the part of the general public a certain, gra you know, people are gravitating towards credible brands. People are gravitating towards credible, truthful brands, which are known to tell the truth and are known to be credible. So I think there is some hope. But generally, you're right, there is this rampaging anti-intellectualism. Uh, and the way you win trust is to just keep doing what you do, uh, you know, just keep putting out the kind of analysis and fact-based, uh, credible analysis which, uh, which, you know, which some of us believe we're doing, uh, although others may disagree. So uh, just keep persuading and trying to do, you know, trying to do the journalism you believe in. Uh, is this on? Uh, hi, ma'am. My name is Paluvi. Uh, so, adding on to his point about anti-intellectualism, I was wondering what your response is to the... Um, there's this constant critique of liberals that we are intellectually arrogant and we don't listen to the other side and we're dismissive of... Um, that we think we know better than more than 50% of this country, that, that by virtue of being liberal, you don't listen to the other side and you think that you know better, essentially. And you don't, your priorities are skewed and you don't understand what this country wants. What is, as a liberal, what is the response to that? Absolutely. I think that, you know, liberals can be sometimes equally uh, intolerant, uh, in equally, equally can be an orthodoxy in themselves, uh, can be equally uh, sort of uh, uh, harsh on dissent, uh, which is why, you know, I, for example, uh, for example, you know, the play Nathuram Godse Boltoe, which is a play on the life of Nathuram Godse, and it is told from the point of view of Nathuram Godse, whose politics I find repellent and repulsive but I was the one who I, I mean I, I was part of a editorial team who actually wrote a, a defense of why that play should be shown uh, why that play should be screened because we believe that even though to us that kind of politics may be repulsive and repellent but we don't believe in bans and so if you don't believe in bans then you believe that every point of view has to be ventilated you can't say you know ban uh, Salman Rushdie but don't ban Wendy Donegar or ban ban Taslima Nasreen, but don't ban many Ramayanas uh, by Ramanujan. So it, you, you can't be selective in your liberalism. You can't be uh, skewed to one side if you're in, in, your, in your liberalism. So you have to be, I think, even-handed. And yes, there is a cause for introspection among liberals also. And I think, as I said, you know, we have failed. I think that's why we're seeing the rise of illiberalism. I think the, under the cover of liberal democracy, there's been corruption, there's been uh, graft, there's been a lot of wrongdoing. So I think liberal democracy is suffering from contradictions. I think liberals do need to introspect. I think uh, liberals do need to renew the liberal project. You know, it needs to be renewed. It needs to overhaul. Like I said, I think there needs to be a moral rediscovery of the liberal project. Uh, but it's worth fighting for, and it's, uh, it, in my view, uh, it, it's 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 worth it's it's a goal worth fighting for. And I believe that mistakes have been made, but it needs to be renewed and overhauled. I think uh, Nilav has the mic, and Vivek, that will be the last question, right? Good evening, ma'am. My name is Nilav Banerjee. It's an honor to have you. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. So, ma'am, my question is with respect to um, something you mentioned, the lines of how uh, journalism has to be objective, or how the whole idea that it's all about facts. The similar struggle that we as lawyers also face regarding the whole subjectivity of interpreting things and objectivity that we try to propose or the ideal we aspire. So I want to ask you, is it really the case that with journalism, it's only about facts and that facts don't need to be contextualized in a certain you know, manner wherein inherently there's going to be subjectivity? So is it firstly a probable thing to happen? And secondly, is it even an ideal to you know, preach in the first place, especially in times where information is so polarized uh, in times wherein you, uh, as a part of your uh, profession, you have to give opinions regarding various things. For example, a bill, for example, a certain speech that happens. What is your stand on that? So, I mean, that's just an illustrative list. So, uh, there's no compromise on facts. 
I don't think journalism is like law where you uh, argue a case uh, and look at facts in different ways. For a journalist, there is no compromise on facts. In 1984, 2,733 Sikhs were killed. Fact. In uh, Gujarat riots, a certain number of Muslims were killed, a certain number of Hindus were killed, a certain number of Parsis were killed. Fact. Uh, in emergency, 253 journalists were jailed. Fact. Uh, in Maharashtra, a certain number of farmers have committed suicide. Fact. Fact-based, credible information is our trade. Without it, there is no journalism. So I think, you know, if we get lost in the relativism of facts, then we are look, you know, we are, we are down a very slippery slope. We have to stick to the facts and we have to verify the facts. We have to verify credible information. That is the, that is the uh, mark of the journalist. And we have to, you know, maybe we get it wrong. And I think it's, uh, it's also a mark of credible journalism if on, if on facts you go wrong. And then you, and you apologize and say that, you know, we got this wrong. This was a mistake. This is the real fact. But there is no relativity on facts. You know, there are a certain finite people in this room. That's a fact. I mean, we can't say uh, there are a certain number of people in this room, but there are not that many people in this room. So actually, it's a half full room. It is a half full room, but we can count the number of people and say these are the number of people in the room. So we ha journalism is, is a, le a little less metaphysical than the law. <laughs> we have to stick to the facts. Hi. Uh, my name is Vivek Mukherjee. Uh, so we can go on and talk about the merits of uh, a coalition government, but the uh, problem with that is we cannot institutionalize it. We cannot ensure a yeah. coalition government. <clears throat> so in terms of electoral reforms, do you think that we should do away with the first-past-the-post system now? And, That's uh, a very good question. I mean, all your questions have been fantastic, and that is a very good question. You know, I think the first-past-the-post system... Uh, you know, there are certain uh, very serious anomalies uh, in that, in the sense that uh, you can enjoy a very small percentage of the vote, but you can still win the election. Uh, so, in fact, you know, this government has a majority with 31% of the vote. Indira Gandhi in 1977, her worst election when she was defeated, got 44% of the vote. So, she was defeated with 44, Mr. Modi won with 31. So, uh, th that is the, uh, that is the uh, uh, anomaly of the first-past-the-post system. I think proportional representation, uh, and I, there have been many learned articles on this, I think proportional representation deserves a lot of thought. Uh, I think it deserves a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of analysis as to why perhaps it better reflects the uh, the ground reality of India than the first past the post because in first past the post you know if your votes are concentrated in a certain area you'll win the election but you could get a very high percentage of the vote but it could be scattered and you won't win you lose so uh, uh, these are very serious anomalies, and uh, I think there is a lot of merit in the proportional representation issue. Vivek, we are recording, so please speak into the yeah. mic. Yeah. The uh, greatest criticism. Will this be put out on YouTube or something? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you, you, you can take a call later after a few days. Okay, okay, okay. So the greatest criticism that comes from the proportional uh, system, and there have been private party bills to argue that, yeah. uh, is the fact that you need a lot of education if you have to. Yeah. So would it be suitable for India is the question. That I think increasingly electorates are becoming, uh, you know, much more aware and much more politically savvy than we think they are. You know, it's no longer that great unwashed multitude that is standing in line. I think that because of the penetration of the media, because of the penetration of social media, I think there's much more awareness uh, now than, uh, than we realize. I'm, I'm actually a supporter of proportional representation. I think first past the post is creating... 
a lot of anomalies in our electoral system uh, and uh, it is also leading to uh, you know it's also leading to these kind of uh, massive mandates uh, that are creating these uh, elected autocrats okay so the last question from rajesh yeah yeah my question is that you said that coalitions governments they work better you know, than a single party getting a majority you refer to the nda government uh, led by mr rajpay and the upa government led by mr manmohan upa 1 upa 1 yeah, not upa 2 yes, yes, but uh, you didn't mention because we had coalition government in 1989 those also, those, those ones yes six gujarat and sdv yes. also yes. so how do we accept this thesis that you know, coalition government they are better uh, and we had uh, well they're not necessarily be- you know they're not necessarily uh, they're not always working to a formula of effective governance just because you're a coalition but i think a coalition has a better chance of uh, uh, you know instituting policy and creating a, a more consensual structure of policy making than the present brutish majority government because i think you know you can't say just because it's a coalition government therefore it's a good government or just because you know from 1999 to 1988 1996 we saw all those governments rise and fall gujarat uh, devagauda all of them but uh, they were unstable coalitions and they all fell like nine pins one after the other but uh, so there's no formula but i think that the kind of consensus building that a coalition government requires and the kind of uh, reconciliation with multiple parties the coalition government requires and the kind of taking people on board uh, with allies uh, requires sometimes you can get instead of coalition dharma you can have coalition adharma so uh, sometimes they don't it doesn't work well so there's no formula but i think that if you look at the big majority governments of indira gandhi rajiv gandhi and narendra modi these have been the three majority governments on balance they have been less performing in terms of policy than vajpayee or upa1 is and my view about the nehru's government in the 50s because and nehru's go- well nehru was sui generis you know nehru was sui generis nehru was a believer in democracy nehru was a believer in institutional democracy and nehru was a believer in democratic institutions we are talking about an era where of elected autocrats who don't believe in democracy and who don't believe in institutions who don't believe in democratic processes nehru kept asking for an opposition he asked jay prakash narayan to be his opposition leader jay prakash narayan refused so nehru i think um, uh, i think uh, is a different category yes so my last uh, inter- but then you know but even uh, but even nehru uh, i think uh, a there is a blot on nehru i am an admirer of nehru but i think the uh, dismissal of the nambudripat government in 1956 to me that is a, a huge stain on on nehru's leadership and i think a lot of people blame indira gandhi for it that she was the congress president at the time and she pushed nehru to dismiss that government but i think uh, it remains a fun- fundamental taint on nehru uh, even s gopal his uh, great admiring biographer has actually written very critically about that decision and i think the consensus among historians now is that it was nehru's decision and it was nehru who was seriously alarmed that uh, pictures of uh, Gandhi and uh, Nehru were being removed from schools and instead pictures of Lenin and Stalin were being put up by the marxists so i think the uh, erosion of uh, the, uh, the, the you know the urban uh, the, the, the 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 rural poor which was congress's zealously guarded vote bank i think was very very bothersome to uh, nehru i think he saw the communists as a fundamental threat uh, so i think that is certainly a stain on uh, on nehru but you know uh, even this uh, great democrat the colossus of the freedom movement he faced dissent within just 10 years of his uh, prime ministership so uh, if even he faced that kind of dissent then uh, you know then the others certainly have no saga <coughs> sagarika the point is and uh, rajesh nehru was not that powerful within the party 
that's also a point because you had a syndicate yes and there were number of party presidents he did not lie yes and on their elections he expressed his displeasure but he was controlled by the party so you have to have some mechanism of control if you have an elected uh, person with very clear massive mandate then the party should have that kind of control as it happened during nehru but if you have a same person you know controlling party as well as government the chances of him becoming dictator are very high in a coalition government we are, i'm not saying that coalition government is better there's no in formula coalition, yeah but in coalition government the chances of chief minister or prime minister becoming dictator are less less and also they you know i believe they function better in terms of cons- finding consensus on policies i feel that they they function better and find out in, you know in, in what indira gandhi did was she smashed the, the syndicate you know uh, she finished off the kamrajes and the atulya ghosh and the nijalingappas and the uh, the great big powerful party bosses that existed in the congress at the time indira gandhi finished them off by splitting the congress and then of course going to the people with garibi hatao and becoming the supreme leader so she she actually destroyed the leadership of the congress and uh, so i think that then after once she had done that to the congress uh, i think then she as i said she became the playbook indira gandhi is the play had wrote the playbook of the elected autocrat in india that's in my book <laughs> do you think that is the reason that the current dispensation while it is very critical of is men, ne- yeah, it they is not critical never of never you know they train their guns on um, on uh, nehru on uh, rahul gandhi sonia gandhi jawala nehru but never on indira gandhi and actually you know tv rajeshwar the uh, the intelligence chief he's written in his book that the rss sarsang chalak of the in 1974 he was uh, bala saheb devras he had actually he was a great admirer of indira gandhi and a great admirer of the nas bandi scheme because he thought that the family planning particularly among the muslims was a very good idea because it was uh, stopping uh, muslims from reprodu- you know produ- reproducing so because of this agenda he actually wanted to meet uh, indira gandhi and convey his congratulations to her that what he has what she has done with nas bandi among the minority communities but indira gandhi was so uh, fearful of this that she uh, refused to refuse i mean she refused to not fearful but she of course hated the rss and uh, in fact she was the one who banned the rss you know locked up the rss put them all in jail but they still today revere her as a heroine i think mr narendra modi is trying very hard to be indira gandhi <laughs> okay i think that's an appropriate note for us to close and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so I mean though I just wanted to actually add one last point which is similar to what Pallavi was saying uh, so I read the short piece by Pankaj Mishra recently in the New York Review of Books uh, where he actually compares the election of Obama and Trump but he comes to the conclusion that both in many ways are comparable to the fact of the rise of the personality cult so that's a common theme which cuts across the discussion today as well uh, so it's very easy to dislike populist autocrats who stand on a different ideological footing uh, but it's quite likely that you may end up supporting an elected autocrat because your views because match he's with a hero. them right yeah so it's quite possible right so i think that was the running theme of this uh, discussion that we just had Uh, so we we thank uh, Ms. Ghosh for taking out the time and spending the day in Hyderabad, and and certainly uh, let's not be let's also read about the speakers who come and make sure what their professional affiliations <laughs> are, right before we. But don't worry, I yeah, ask yeah. myself. No, I ask myself that question every day. Right, Am right. I a journalist? <laughs> yeah. So, so I think he accidentally asked you a, a sort of a reflective question. Uh, but, uh, but 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 thank you all. I think if we uh, should all ask that question. Right. You know? <laughs> Actually, are we still journalists? Right. 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 Okay. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a pleasure.